Hi folks, we're going to continue on with our performance pay in the individual level with our last uh, method, which is a special purpose incentive. Now, special purpose incentives are really designed to motivate some specific predetermined types of behavior that the employer wants to see. So some examples of that might be bonuses that get paid to employees who, who uh, score high customer satisfaction ratings uh, from their customers, uh, things like suggestion systems, uh, maybe employers are looking for employees to find ways to cut costs, to increase revenues, to offer better service, to improve particular programs, and maybe they might give them an incentive uh, through a suggestion system whereby employees would submit suggestions and the one that's picked um, is maybe uh, given some kind of reward. And there's also um, an example with attendance uh, incentives. Uh, Lazy Boy, your textbook says, uh, had recently put one in their organization via their union and how that kind of worked which is kind of a nice thing. The union included a clause in the collective labor agreement that provided for an attendance bonus whereby employees who uh, have no absences in a calendar year are going to receive an extra eight hours of pay deposited into their RSP account, which is kind of a nice thing when you're trying to provide or save for retirement. But, um, you know, again, sometimes with that kind of uh, attendance incentives, sometimes there are some pros and cons to those as well. But, um, and your textbook does a really good idea, a, a really good job of communicating uh, some of their ideas and some of the pros and cons of uh, incentives for attendance and I'll let you guys look at that but now that we have a better understanding of what a special purpose incentive is some of the advantages of course is that it does get employees to focus on particular behaviors that uh, the company wants them to focus on some of the disadvantages of course is that it's only going to focus on those behaviors and not on other behaviors that the company may want them to see they're only going to focus on the ones that they'd get um, uh, an incentive for and sometimes the advantages and disadvantages can be based on the type of uh, special purpose incentive that you're trying to create. Say, for example, suggestion systems. They have their pros and their cons just as a type of incentive system in that, you know, uh, sometimes it can take a long time to actually implement the suggestion, which means you may not see some cost savings or revenue generation or whatever it is the incentives des or the uh, suggestions design to do for quite some period of time so that could be a disadvantage but there are advantages and disadvantages depending right we look at uh, say attendance programs where you're going to um, give people an incentive for attendance well certainly um, that's great if um, uh, in the sense that it might discourage people from being absent on a discretionary basis so they want to take a day off they they don't come in right uh, they're not there but maybe if they find this you know motivating to them to get money added to their RSP like the people at Lazy Boy maybe they'll come so again it, that could be an advantage of that specific plan um, the disadvantage is say you have people who don't want to miss work and they're sick because they want the incentive they may come and they're sick and they spread germs and that's a health and safety issue so again you know these different incentive programs can have certain advantages and disadvantages now, let's move on to um, uh, group performance pay. So we're finished individual and we're going to look specifically at three types of group performance pay programs. Gain sharing, goal sharing, and a competitive bonus. Now, we're going to focus mostly on gain and goal sharing in our discussion here. Uh, and we do have a chapter later on where we're going to look at examples of these kinds of plans. But suffice it to say that sometimes an organization might put in a gain sharing plan where maybe the company is going to give out a cash reward or maybe um, um, uh, to employees or maybe they generate cost sharing um, or cost savings um, uh, from the plan uh, and those cost savings whatever they amount to are actually split in some way maybe not 50 50 60 40 whatever it is that they agreed to between the company and the employees okay um, depending on how they perform how uh, so for example say uh, say the unit or the company wants to um, uh, or some a new production if it's implemented will save costs will make them produce uh, a product faster uh, more accurately whatever so whatever the the benefits are the financial benefits from there the company might uh, the company will split with the workers in some fashion 
So usually those are, a lot of them are implemented in, in production environments uh, with, the, with the support of unions. But again, you want to make sure that whatever the cost savings or the productivity gain is going to be is meaningful to the workers in terms of the amount. Goal sharing means that the company might have a pre-specified performance goal that it wants to meet, right? And they're going to give the workers some kind of a bonus, okay, as a group, and it will be split, okay, when they meet that pre-specified performance goal. A disadvantage might be here is that if you don't meet the goal, you may get nothing. If you meet the goal, you get the bonus. If you don't, you don't get it. And a competitive bonus is one whereby there's group pay plans, okay, that reward certain work groups for outperforming other work groups. I don't really see in my own experience a lot of those, and I think one of the reasons largely is that... Um, you know, a lot of organizations want to foster cooperation amongst groups. They don't really want to pit them against each other. But in any case, we'll go talk a little bit more about gain sharing. Again, if you can uh, reap the benefits of cost savings and improve productivity, you might find that the program, the gain sharing program, can be self-funding because whatever gets paid out is really being made up right over time by the workers in terms of the cost savings and pro production efficiencies that they may be generating right it can also if people are, are seeing that the reward is is substantial enough it can get them to keep looking for cost efficiencies and savings right it can improve morale okay it may reduce the need for management to control the workers because the workers are actually now kind of motivated by the rewards they're getting right from from implementing a gain sharing program so these things can all be be positive. Some of the negatives here is that it might create some people who loaf, right? Free riders we call them are loafers. So they might just be riding on the coattails of the people who are working at making the gain sharing program work and they may get a payment even though they don't deserve it. It can become a dissatisfier uh, because of the free rider problem but they do tend to have high discontinuation rates and part of the problem or the reason for that is that in many organizations they find that the the larger the number of employees who are going to share in the savings, obviously the less there is for any individual employee. So that, coupled with free rider programs, might mean that some companies are uh, have to discontinue them because they're not motivating. If we look at goal sharing pro programs, um, they're a little more flexible than gain sharing programs because the goals can be jointly determined by management and the employee. It only rewards a major productivity gain so it's very easy to quantify and to know what we're rewarding on. And again, as with the gain sharing, it can reduce the need for external control. A disadvantage again, um, uh, there could be uh, difficulty in establishing realistic and equitable goals, particularly if you don't include the employees in setting and establishing those goals. It can cause frustration if the efforts fall short of the goal because, again, in many organizations, if you don't meet it, you don't get the, the reward, right? And again, there's no incentive to go past the goal. You want employees to maximize, right? But if you only reach a goal and that's what the payment's determined on, then there's no incentive to go beyond it. Beyond it. And again, because some groups may not be able to reach their goals, some organizations may discontinue some of the goal sharing plans. So uh, other team-based rewards, uh, we refer to them as pooled performance pay systems, whereby uh, you can have a pay plan in which the members share equally in a performance bonus for that group. Examples of pooled performance pay systems are group commissions and group piece rates. So say for example that uh, uh, a perf uh, where uh, the commissions of a group of uh, commissioned workers, we're saying here sales workers, but they could be any workers that work on commission, they're pooled and then they're shared out equally among members of a group. Uh, sometimes you, you notice that uh, when you go to restaurants and tip, sometimes some restaurant owners m might take the tips, pool them and divide them equally to make sure the people in the back, not just the servers, but the people in the back, the dishwashers, the cooks, they're all getting something, right? So they could be divided equally. So that's an example of where you might see it even in a restaurant establishment and you could have group piece rates so again with this performance pay plan the group members are going to get paid based on the number of completed products produced by the group so depending on what the group produces that might be a way to allocate some incentive if they've met their goals on a piece rate basis now some organizational so the third type we talked about individual group now let's look at organization performance pay systems the one that's most popular is profit sharing whereby the company provides a bonus payment to employees based on how profitable the company was examples of profit sharing programs could include current distribution 
So what happens is that whatever the amount of the profits are that the company splits with the employees, they give it back to them in cash. So that's current distribution. They give it back to them in cash, maybe in that quarter or at the end of the year. Deferred profit sharing plans are those whereby those savings are kept in a special account for employees and sometimes with this accumulation of profit sharing bonus that accumulates in a little account in their name, in the employee's name, is a way that many companies uh, might uh, uh, provide a pension for employees. So whatever profits that the employees have been responsible for helping the company to generate get set aside and when the employee retires or wishes to retire, this will be part of their retirement uh, that they get, their retirement payout that they get. They can pay it out at, if when they terminate, and some companies set it up so that you can roll it into an RSP. So these are actually good programs to have. And then there could be combination plans, some of which you defer and some of which is currently distributed. That's a good thing to do sometimes because at least employees are seeing cash come into their hand and they feel good about receiving a reward immediately, but they also know that part of the reward is being deferred until retirement or until they terminate the company. So they know there's savings happening on their behalf. So those are good things to do too. Another way is some companies have employee stock plans. So what happens is that uh, the employer might have a way of encouraging people to buy stock in the company. How does that happen? Well, some stock maybe they wouldn't have to purchase. Some employee stock programs can be an employee stock bonus. So when employees meet goals and objectives that further the, the goals and objectives of the organization, maybe those uh, employees are paid and they're just given by giving them stock. So it's not a cash payout, it's stock that they get. Some employees are allowed to purchase stock through an employee stock purchase program and a, a lot of people do this through payroll deduction. Usually it's based on the number of years of service uh, and their level in an organization but many times all employees can, can buy but again um, uh, uh, sometimes depending on how much money you make some people can buy more than others obviously because a certain percentage of your pay will go toward buying stock of the company and what might happen is that say you retire or you terminate the company you can take those stocks with you and, and put them in your own private portfolio they just get transferred over and you can keep them as long as they're earning money for you right so you can buy those stocks and the advantage to the employee is that they don't have to go through a broker so they save uh, fees on uh, making the uh, making the purchase uh, of the stock so there's a savings for employees and the company provides the brokerage services for you so that's great the other option you have here for for buying stock and and many companies now the stock option uh, options used to be available only for executives but we see uh, organizations like Starbucks offering it to their baristas now and it's a it's a program whereby when you sign up you also sign up with an organization and you say, well, hey, um, the, the organization says we're going to allow you to buy stock two years from now and pay, say, for example, $10 a share. The employee says, okay, fine. Now, in two years, when you get the right to exercise the option, if the shares are trading at $12 a share, you pay your $10 a share, but you get shares that are worth $12 a share. That's not a bad deal because you just made $2 a share. If you have 100 shares, you know, you've made $200. If you have 1,000 shares, you made $2,000. If you have 10,000 shares, you've made $20,000, right? But you still have to come up with $10 a share, all right, in order to buy them at $12 a share. Now, say, for example, the shares two years down the road are only trading at $8 a share. Well, obviously, you're not going to pay 10 if they're only trading at 8. You're going to lose money then, right? You don't have to exercise the option. So you can decide if you're going to exercise the option when that time at which you have to make your decision comes. So companies will set this up for employees and again it's a way of you as an employee sharing in the risks that, that companies share in, right? So these plans are offered. So what I want you to do now is make sure you check your online course to know what's due this week and next week and make sure as always that you plan for what's coming due. Have a great week and thanks for your attention.